Hey everybody, it's Lori with the Catch a Pocket Podcast, and today I have episode 48, Bill Goffrier. Bill played in the legendary rock band, The Embarrassment. He's also a painter in our community right now. He goes, he sells his wares at the Old Town Farm and Art Market on Saturdays. He has a booth. Go check him out. Buy some of his paintings. Talk him up. He shared his life with me, and I'm really proud to bring it to you. In the middle and at the end of the episode, I'm going to put a couple of the embarrassment songs. I hope that you all enjoy them. Bill did give me permission to put these on. I'm not going to um, do anything on my end to make any profit off of it. I hope you don't either. But you can go to Bandcamp and buy the Embarrassment EP for yourself. And also there's some other um, albums that are on Amazon Prime Music. Go buy them. Check them out. Excellent, excellent music. Totally loving it. Um, I'm going to play Celebrity Art Party in the middle and Wellsville at the end from the EP, the Embarrassment EP. And um, I'm really glad you're here. So stick around and let me know what you think. Here's Bill Goffrey, episode 48. I'm here with Bill Goffrier, the well-known artist, guitar player for The Embarrassment, and also well-known artist painting-wise in Wichita, and also pretty darn good left-handed pickleball player. (laughs) Thank you. You're getting, you know... Hey, you're getting all the props here. (laughs) Um, Also, you were a teacher, so uh, all those things are... You know, to me, they're like an art in themselves. So, um, thanks for coming on the Catch a Pocket podcast, Bill. Thanks for having me, Lori. All right. Well, we start the podcast with your life in general. So, where were you born? I was born in Kewanee, Illinois. You know, famous as the hog capital of Illinois. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody knows that. Um, little town. Uh, um, parents grew up there and everything, and grandparents were there. We, we moved to Peoria when my dad was uh, joining the the workforce. Um, I was born pretty late. I had two two young two older sisters. Sorry, and uh, I wasn't I wasn't supposed to happen at all. I was a <laughs> an accident. They they claim a happy accident. Yeah, but I always sort of wondered about that in the back <laughs> of my mind, but. They made the best of it because yeah, I, I was the only son, and um, so you were spoiled then. Because... I was definitely spoiled as the youngest of three. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. And the it. youngest boy on top of that. So like, yeah, I didn't know that had anything to do with it, but apparently it did. It does. Yeah, um, a little sometimes. I'm sure there's <laughs> there's cases otherwise. Um, so Peoria is where your dad found a good job, high paying job to pay for the family. Yeah. And then um, you went to school there as a elementary it, kid? Or? I, yeah, I started, uh, I, I, well, I was, I was halfway through second grade, as I recall, in a Catholic school where the, the, the only memory I have was because it was traumatic, and that, <laughs> that's often the case, but um, because she was trying to beat the left-handedness out of me oh. with with her ruler <laughs> and it didn't yeah. work um and, and that's nuns. not why we moved away but but uh, my dad got a job offer in which here in wichita and uh the rest of the family wasn't too excited about leaving illinois and, and all their friends you know mm-hmm. that they established i didn't care it didn't make any difference to me and maybe i was happy about getting away from that nun but yeah. uh they never put me back in a um, Catholic school mm. after that, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't going to hurt their little boy. Anyway, so what did your dad do to, to uh, was he aircraft? Not at all, no. See, he had, well, 
funny you should say that because he hated flying after he spent World War II uh, in a bomber as a co-pilot oh. on, on a B-24. And they even uh, crash-landed at, at least once and, and uh, you know, were shot at a lot. And, and it was horrifying. He was, you know, a teenager doing mm-hmm. that. And, but he survived World War II and, um, and he was a crooner at that time too. He, he, he was gifted with this beautiful voice he, he sounded like a young Frankie Sinatra, although I just found uh, in his old high school yearbook again, I happened to run across uh, where they credited him as being the Ray Eberly of Kiwani <laughs> High School. And I had to then go look up a YouTube uh, example of Ray Eberly singing. Who, he was like a big band singer in the early 40s. Mm-hmm. Uh, not quite at Sinatra's level, but, you know, good. And so... That was um, where his mom was hoping he would go, and I'm and probably my mom, who was his like high school sweetheart. I think she was maybe like hoping he would be a big success. He won some awards like regionally, still in Illinois, and but he had stage fright, and he he didn't really care to pursue that at right. all. So he studied business at North uh, Northwestern. My mom and and uh, and he were both at Northwestern University there in Illinois. And, yeah. and then um, he wanted to apply that. So he got into the fashion industry, f- fashion business. He became a retail clothing buyer. Okay. And and that... I totally get that. That ended up doing real well for him by the time he got to, well, Wichita. That turned into his lifelong career with Henry's Incorporated. Oh, he, nice. A lot of... I, I meet a lot of uh, older women still that are still around that were his shoppers. And, they, oh, your dad. Oh, I had such a crush on your dad. <laughs> he, he, you know, he never lost his hair. Oh, wow. I, I, did, I did not inherit his, uh, his, <laughs> his hair at all. Um, he would sing to him and oh, buy and he, he would only great get up, exquisite taste in clothing. He'd only get up and sing if you... If, you, they would socialize at the candle club and if you got a few drinks in him and the whoever was the entertainer for the night would you know he could say oh, so do you know uh for the good times yeah you, know, okay. <laughs> you played it for her you can you know, play it for me hey, get up and sing for the for the good times and everybody would oh <laughs> what was your dad's name same as me bill bill yeah, bill Goffrey, yeah. he's yeah I'm the third. He was junior. Oh, he was junior and you're the third. Okay. Yeah, his father was even uh, actually born since he was German. Mm. Um, I think probably his father's birth certificate probably read Wilhelm Karl Goffrier. <laughs> and, yeah, very German. So yeah. they, they kind of softened it to, to fit in better yeah. with here in here in the united states and sure it was you know it was kind of it wasn't always appreciated to be too german connected i feel yeah i had some great neighbors called the dipper schmitz and uh <laughs> they they w- harold would tell me stories about that but um anyway mm. so you were you were young and you moved to wichita and your dad worked for Henry's as a buyer, clothing buyer, and you yeah. went to school at a regular public school? At first I did. Mm-hmm. Well, no, a- actually, oh, even that was. Okay, there was a school called Fabrique, which I guess doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And I think I finished second grade there, and I think it was part of the public school district at I think the time. So, so I didn't get much of a sense. Of, but uh, So then maybe because we moved or... You know, it took us a while to get settled in. We were living in a hotel when we first got to Wichita, as I recall. Mm. But I ended up at uh, then Cos Harris School, which is now Price Harris. Okay. And I started to learn that neighborhood pretty well. But um, apparently, I well, they, they were giving tests to third graders or something, and um, so I was, I, I was. Ask, they they wanted to put me in this special class in Minaha, the accelerated, mm, okay, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And I don't know if that was a new thing or what, but um, 
I just thought, oh, okay, we're get, well, you're going to be in this uh, smart kids class or something. Right. And uh, so it was out of the neighborhood. Right. But um, it was, I, I thought it was cool. And um, I still have friends around here and, and in other states, far and wide, but uh, friends that I made in fourth grade because we got to stay together for three years and the move from cla- the same basically oh, okay. the same group and um it, it, it i didn't realize till much later how what what a gift that was because like we made such strong bonds you know some of those mm-hmm. kids uh i knew all through high school I was really close to one of them was my best friend until you know we finished high school here and um so where did you where did you go to middle and high school or, well, or junior high and high school? Uh, Coleman Junior High and then Southeast High School, the the original Southeast. So yeah, once you got out of sixth grade, it just went back into normal right circulation. No more accelerated <laughs> class here at Coleman. No, or... I think I had some honors class mm-hmm. you know, or something, but I started to get really lazy in high school, and I was just too into my art. Um, so that's when you did start getting into art then? No, I think even in fourth grade, uh, the well, even in third grade, actually, I remember in the third grade classroom, um, I every, every chance I got, I was drawing on papers on my desk, and whether it was just separate papers or messing up things that we were supposed to be doing i don't know i I just (laughs) always wanted to draw and and i guess i got a lot of encouragement for it too or attention i was extremely extremely shy kid but i guess i could i had a sense that drawing sort of got me some good attention and recognition yeah Yeah. it's like oh okay people like that i can draw so uh, you know, I felt like I probably couldn't do anything else well. I mean, I knew, I knew like, okay, I guess they say I'm pretty smart or wouldn't be in this class, okay, right. academically, but, you know, that doesn't, that, you don't stand out or anything. And, and I guess I, since I didn't know how to socially connect with people or anything like that, I guess I, I sort of liked that drawing would at least be, Get Start people that to sort of care about what I was do- yeah. doing. Yeah. Uh, so I that was my expression, my form of expression. I I actually took guitar lessons too early yeah. on. And where did you take from, those? From, uh, I mentioned the Candle Club already. There was like one of the performers that we would hear at the Candle Club because sometimes I'd get to go out. You know, the, yeah. My parents would take the kids out, and you know, his job, I think involved a lot of uh schmoozing with people at the candle club you know on their own the grown-ups but he would take or they would take the the kids out for a meal sometimes uh-huh. and we'd hear this guy i think his last name was Moutre. um he looked just like john denver he was like wichita's john denver in okay. in appearance anyway uh-huh. and he would perform with just a guitar like a singer you know doing cover songs whatever sure and did he um, do any john denver i wonder now i'm not even <laughs> sure if like during this period if if there even was john denver okay okay yet uh but um somehow you know we knew that he gave lessons privately in his home which is over by uh the uh like like kellogg and hillside uh, this, okay. this little side street that they sort of walled off from the highway his house was and um they sent me there, and and I didn't learn. It was kind of the Mel Bay uh-huh. guitar. Uh, what do you call? It? There was a series of books, you know. So he would give me the book and point it. I was learning how to play melodies, mm-hmm. but I wasn't learning chords. I thought, this, is, this is. I mean, I didn't know cool. any. I didn't know any better. But what could I do? I I couldn't like accompany myself and sing. I could pick out melodies Mm -hmm. of a song and hopefully play them but there was no chord to it there was no accompaniment i lost interest in that anyway and so and that was when you were how old i like 10 okay what third grade i'd be eight nine 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 or ten probably 
So fourth or fifth Something. grade there. Probably. Um, and then and, you're, you, but you're drawing, you're doing that. So yeah. you already have this um, art um, gift. Like it's your, something that you're good at. So I would call it gift, you know, because I mean, some people are not good at drawing or music. Yeah, I felt it was, I mean, of course, I wasn't analyzing it myself, but I understood from, see, since my dad was so busy working, and I, I realized I was very lucky. I mean, I can complain about some of my childhood, and I do, to my wife, <laughs> but then she reminds me how much better I had it than a lot of people, including her. So it's like, you know, right. what are you complaining about? But I can complain, but I realized that, I was very spoiled as the youngest child. And my mother was, you know, full-time homemaker. Mm, wow. my, it was very traditional setup because dad's job was very busy, but it was also, you know, enough income. And that was, you know, she was a very traditional housewife and mother. She wanted to be constantly just working on keeping the house up, keep, per, a perfectionist and cooking all the meals. And mm, no right. one else doing anything. So um, part of that also was like listening to teachers and Going professionals saying, you know, Bill, yeah, Bill's showing a lot of talent for this. I think you should, you know, encourage the. So, you know, they got me painting lessons at the Art Association when I was oh, wow. like a fourth grader or something. Wow. Taking lessons from uh, Betty Dickerson who I only learned, you know, later had this great reputation that she was part of this, you know, top circle, this community of local artists and teachers. And, and here I was probably the only kid in her painting class. And she'd set up still lifes and while all the grownups are in the other part of the studio painting from a nude model, you know, they weren't, mm. they obviously weren't going to have me do that, but, <laughs> but I was in their midst and I would, getting to use oil paints wow. and, and paint light and shadow and, I thought, and how well, the chemicals is... and the the yeah you know like, there's there's something to that because i couldn't do that in in school even in high school we weren't using um oil paints we would use acrylics and or chalk gouache or yeah maybe some watercolor but um and that was fine too but uh i i was lucky to have access an experience early on so i knew by high school that that's what i was pursuing art art although uh one of well my best friend from minaha that, that he and i were growing up parallel paths we both wanted to be you know artists and he we kind of competitive that way mm -hmm. um seeing you know how we could outdo each other on a project or something <laughs> but but we also teamed up and we collaborated on on filmmaking. We started getting into cool. eight millimeter and super eight filmmaking, and even at Coleman, the art, the art teacher let us skip his curriculum. He said, "Okay, you guys know you you know all this stuff. You want to make a movie? Go up in this loft. Had this whole extra room, and we would just go up and work on this movie project." Whoa. A sar and the rest of the class would have to do whatever he That's wanted. pretty cool. So yeah, That's we were bad. we were pretty privileged. Yeah. Um but yeah, we it it ran its course. We got it out of our system. Yeah. You don't make movies to, to this day or it no, doesn't really interest you or it did, I mean it was fascinating. I've loved movies uh all along. I'm I'm a huge movie buff, but mostly of old school um like from silent films and, mm -hmm. and early animation up through um, classic Hollywood stuff. So I was always just fascinated by all the mechanics of not, you know, not the acting so much or any of that, but the behind the camera stuff, editing right. and, and special effects and directing. And so we were fancying ourselves uh, going down that path, you know, who, who knew how to, you know, be an independent filmmaker but we i guess we weren't ambitious enough right or maybe you so. just didn't have the best equipment or something like that something yeah. to pull you w one step further or something yeah if we'd have gotten maybe one lucky break or because we we entered some thing we worked hard on we entered it into some kodak contest and we didn't get any recognition for that so we figured well maybe this 
this isn't our thing. You know, we're not, yeah. maybe we're not as good at this as Other we want to be. And right. I got back to my, my solo art, you know, where I could handle my drawing and painting. And that was fine. That was a, still a great outlet for me. And I probably was starting to think about music again, too, because. Right. Yeah, I had that itch. So that was high so, school then? Yeah. And then it was rock and roll. It was pop rock or what do they call what did they call the embarrassment it was something oh, pop it was blister pop blister that that pop. came later that came out of an interview that uh our singer john was trying to <laughs> just off the cuff trying to come up with well how do you describe your music i think it was on kmuw uh college radio uh -huh. here at one time when we were performing and, and that was what the interviewer said and he we'd never heard him say that before and he came up with blister pop we call it we thought it was appropriate yeah actually we're thinking about it but i always kinda, thought of it more like a new new wave sort of music well see we didn't yeah we couldn't categorize it that way because there was always that the two camps punk versus new wave when we were okay. starting out it was like it was are kind you of punk both. or new wave so <laughs> and we thought you know what we're neither one and <laughs> like <laughs> we kind of make fun of both of them and we just kind of do we, I don't know. We were always sort of poking at people yeah. and ourselves. But right. uh, but I'd been listening. Well, we'd all been listening to uh, different kinds of music up until. I mean, we were listening to glam rock. I, of course, I grew up with the Beatles. Right. I'm old enough. Which is the best band still. in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's not, never been anything like that, of course. And no one who didn't live through that can never appreciate how that really felt i guess to have yeah. to have that one band be so significant i guess well you can uh, yeah i mean you couldn't i can't i didn't live that so i can't i didn't experience it but what i can do is just listen to all those songs and then think how were they so far ahead of their time like that how did they do that that's amazing one song after another like that yeah i mean amazing talent and chemistry but maybe they're you know mix in some lucky breaks and or maybe it was meant always meant to be that yeah, I don't know. It's just I so know. wild. I, I'm sure there's probably a book about the subject. I'm sure there's several. <laughs> that might explain it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, in the 60s, with older sisters, because they, they were buying Beatles records as mm -hmm. they came out. So even I was showing up at school in, I, I, I think it, I can picture that fourth grade classroom at Minaha probably bringing in... Um, you know, a Beatles, some Beatles albums and, and wanting to, like, show and tell or something. And so that was my whole musical uh, environment was the Beatles and the Monkees, which... Uh -huh. Which were, like, a direct rip off of the Beatles. Yeah, but to me it was like, oh, they're just as good as the Beatles, aren't they're they? Yeah, they were good. I couldn't tell the difference sometimes, but... Um, <laughs> so I had no use for my dad's... No appreciation for my dad's era of music, of course, because that had been that had been done like twenty years earlier. Can you imagine listening to music that's twenty years older? I mean, think of it. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be like listening to something from the early two thousands, like Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> so, so his music was like, oh, dad, I don't get that at all. And wait, wait, it just changed so dramatically. Though. I know that's just weird. But then it was like. You know, listening to Buddy Holly from the late 50s was like, oh, do you get this? It's like, it's kind of rock. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I kind of get where the Beatles sort of got something out of Buddy Holly. And, and yeah, I could kind of get that. So, um, but, well, that, I didn't learn that till the 70s. But the Beatles <laughs> and the Monkees, that was all I needed and you know we'd watch ed sullivan together every sunday night and see the, the as a family the late, yeah see the latest beatles performance and mom and dad would be like oh bill i can't even understand what they're 
singing. <laughs> that's so funny and because look that's at their how, hair. <laughs> how I, I feel about certain songs yeah. now. Like what? Uh, and I always be trying to convince them. Oh, but mom, but real. I mean, listen to this. His voice. This is a really pretty song. Listen. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, it's not Frank Sinatra. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but and then the seventies came and. Those groups were gone, and I had I was rudderless. Right, had but you discovery. were playing music on your own, or well, you... not in the early seventies. I yeah. just wanted to listen. I was trying to just immerse myself in music, so it was prog rock uh-huh. and glam rock. Okay, and the the big the best thing. Well, it didn't all happen at once, <laughs> but I did. You know, get really, really into Bowie and um, right. Alice Cooper, and because uh, Alice, you know, came to town early on. Bowie didn't, but Alice was here, right. and uh, and and even Dylan in the mid seventy by the mid seventies, like, oh, okay, I get that, and mm-hmm. uh, I get some of these big, huge. Um, I don't know if prog rock is the right or art rock, prog rock, avant. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and uh, all all of that, but all of it seemed like completely out of my reach to like, could I ever do anything like that? Because I, I like I feel like the form, the creative expression of that, and what how powerful those songs can be and the music can be. Like, I would love to be able to create in that medium somehow. Like to to. To write a song to, or to perform a song and be able to connect with people that way. Mm-hmm. But that would really be something, even though like, I have horrible stage fright and um, can't play an <laughs> instrument. <laughs> but, I thought, but then along came the Ramones. Ah, I was now like, we're talking. Oh, yeah. I could handle this on guitar. I could, and I did. I learned all those. Put your hair, put your hair in front of your eyes I if you're scared. I didn't have the or... hair, but I had, I could learn the guitar parts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, simple chords. Simple, uh, movable power chords with, and and uh, for some reason, since I picked up the guitar right-handed, mm-hmm. even knowing that I was left-handed, it didn't make sense. It didn't feel right to play left-handed. It felt more natural to me to play. The right-handed position because I thought, well, all I'm going to do here with my right hand, I'm going to like be really fast. It's all in the wrist because mm-hmm. I want to play like Johnny Ramone. Right. There's no like... Um, Finger picking. Fi- yeah. Uh, the You know, that sort of fine motor skill, I guess is what I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No fine motor skill needed there. That all came with my good left hand because I... I wanted to learn the chords, but also be able to play melodies within the chords. Uh-huh. Like, kind of like the movement of those fingers. Sure. And well, later on, my uh, one of my bandmates, uh, much later on in Boston, appreciated the fact that I did so much with my pinky finger because mm. he had learned more the traditional way, and and I just I'd never even been conscious of that. I just thought, well, well, duh, because I want to play add. some. I want to add melodic phrases into these chords. So right. what else am I going to do? You know, so I, <laughs> I just thought, and you had the dexterity because you're using your yeah. more powerful hand. Yeah. So I guess little by little, yeah, it evolved from just learning enough of the chord, the power chords to play punk rock. I mean, then we were. You know, covering whatever songs we thought we could um, do. I, when I say we, I mean some good childhood friends of mine. You know, mm-hmm. we started playing, and, and but my approach was just okay. They got to be simple songs, and if I can learn the chords, and you think it's enough, then we'll do that. But little by little, I realized I could become more expressive mm-hmm. with it. I could say more do more so right so yeah. that's high school gosh really kind of after i don't think we uh yeah it had to be after because i graduated high school in 76 and i had an art scholarship 
thanks to my high school art teacher, mm-hmm. Mr. Weddle, Don Weddle, uh, my best teacher ever. And he at was Southeast High at School. At Southeast. He okay. was so supportive. And, you know, he helped me uh, put a portfolio together. And, and I, sh- I should have left town to go to St. Louis for, and use my um, scholarship. Right. But I guess I had this inkling that I didn't want to leave town. I wanted to be around my music friends and do art and music both. So, um, and maybe that was the, maybe the first sort of subconscious commitment to being from Wichita, like doing stuff that, we could say, hey, we're representing Wichita. We're, we're from Wichita. We don't right. want to be from somewhere else. Right. There's nothing wrong with being from Wichita. For sure. And, you know, we, we, we looked around. We couldn't find much of a music scene for original music or edgy, you know, really mm-hmm. like avant-garde music. We, we, we weren't seeing that around, but we thought, you know, we're going we're gonna to make a scene here. Right. And we're going to start it. Like it's going on, on in all these other places we think it's really cool. You know, we're hearing all this music. We're going to do it here. Wichita should have this. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want to leave town. And p- probably also it was a good excuse not to leave town because I was still so um, afraid and shy. It's like, I'm going to go to St. Louis where I don't know anybody. And I'm going to, like, no way. I wasn't, <laughs> I don't think I could bring myself to do that. So I gave up the scholarship and I, I but I moved out and got an apartment with, uh, my friend Brent, who then, who was our drummer, yeah, we we went and got our first um, apartment together, and it was because that was affordable easily. I mean, we we worked part time, we paid our rent, and we could right. go to school at WSU. I guess I had some, I must have had some scholarship money from WSU, yeah, because I don't know how I I, I didn't want my parents to pay for my college, but I wanted to go. Right. And I just wanted to to do it on my own and I knew that okay, yeah, I'm going to have a job, going to pay for an apartment. I don't want to live at home. And then we're going to start jamming. We're going to jam, yeah, we're going to jam, we're going to have a band, everything I want to do. And you wrote and it, from from what, the get-go, did you start writing music or you, um, did Brent write music or or did you just like kind of do other people's stuff, like the Ramones and stuff, until well, y- while you're writing and yeah. getting that together? Of course, when you say write, you 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 and I both know we're just talking about like making making up stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> again and again. But. Yeah, say writing loosely. Yeah, I mean like making up, <laughs> like jamming on some songs and uh-huh. coming up with some words. Yeah, writing lyrics out. Um, Right, that kind of right. Yeah, yes. we we. Well, like okay, the first time we had maybe a set where we thought we can, we can actually go play in front of an audience. We have a set, uh-huh. whatever that was supposed to be, maybe forty five minutes of music. Most of it was covers, including okay. a few songs that you could just drag out for you know on and on, just like jam on two chord punk rock noise jam uh-huh. but i think even then there's be there'd be one or two originals like okay yeah okay we wrote a couple songs and they're punk rock and we can include these mm-hmm. and so the first yeah. time you sing those you know no one knows them because you're not singing a song familiar to anyone but you and your bandmates probably at, and the girlfriends and stuff that hang out in the yeah. area and then so at, how does that feel? You know, I always wonder, what? like you're, you're, even big stars, even like whoever's the biggest star right now, um, they have a new song and everybody wants them to sing their old song. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you go to a concert, so yeah, so you just keep plugging away at it over and over, and it's catchy usually, and yeah, it, because that's weird. Um, everyone sings everywhere to your guys songs when i go to your shows now your reunion tour your movie opening um i look around my husband is singing everywhere (laughs) i looked over to the left and every person over there is like just every single word they know it and they're like this and that (laughs) well it's one of the best yeah one of the best things that 
we could ever hope for. It, it, it seems like on a small scale, it seems like, wow, it actually, we actually did manage to get far enough along in our form of expression that we, we created some music that has some lasting value. But, uh, but um, as part of that, we, th we threw out like the first three bands worth of original songs that we wrote. And, and, <laughs> and it was kind of an unusual uh, sequence of events that not every group of young musicians would probably go through when I, th I think back on that. But, you know, the first band we had, um, well, it was three members of what became The Embarrassment because it was John and Brent and I, but we, we were sure that we needed to recruit a singer because none of us, us were going to sing. You know? mm. John was not, he didn't want to face an audience. I didn't want to face an audience. Brent was going to be drumming. So it was out of, so we knew we needed a lead singer and we, 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 we had to like literally put signs up and ads and we met somebody from the other side of town. We met Jim Rosencutter and, mm -hmm. and we finally, we realized that we had, join the east and west factions of the people in wichita who had any appreciation of this new music we mm -hmm. figured like oh so we're it i guess <laughs> it's like right. this is it um and we came together we and we tried to make that work well we, we knew pretty quickly that i mean we just weren't ready and so that didn't last long and then it became a different front man a different name of group some original songs that our friend Bart Iwanis sang as a front man for us mm -hmm. had to be very punky because he was his approach was more like really aggressive uh angry delivery and mm -hmm. um and very non melodic well, okay. kind of yelling vocals kind of so yelly. it it, it yeah. would have it would have put us down the path of being like one of these uh American uh, hardcore bands i guess and we didn't really want to be that, but uh, <laughs> we did have some songs, and they they kind of took shape, but didn't last long because we were very limited still. Uh, so then we were a three piece without him, but we kept the name for a time, I guess. But we were back to being just John and Brent and I. What was the name? The Lemurs. The Lemurs. Yes, okay. Named, named after the an exhibit at the St. Louis Zoo. And um, so, like lemurs, they yeah. eat cranberries. Lemurs are great. Yeah, <laughs> the lowest form of primate. We we could relate to that. Me so, too. Um, we had original songs and we kept performing them. I had to sing them then. So, I guess the only way I got through that was like putting on my punk costume enough that I could play the part of being a punk rocker. Gotcha. Because. I mean, I, I, it wasn't really my life, but I guess I took on the stage Pres persona yeah. of that and tried to, to fit that. So we did some original songs, but uh, why? I don't know why we stopped. It could only have gone for like six months or something. And it's like, no, that's all done. I think we must have had a falling out with John because next thing we know, he was he wasn't involved, and Brent and I. Well, we're still going to college classes at Wichita State mm -hmm. because Brent happened to meet Ron Klaus in a ceramics class, uh, as the story is told in the documentary mm. movie and all this. But but that gave us a way then to to have a new name a new lineup, but still be a trio. So it's still too much burden on me to be um, playing guitar and singing because mm. Ron wasn't interested in singing. And um, But we wrote all new songs. We threw out all of the lemur stuff. Not that there was a lot of it, but whatever because original songs. Because you couldn't scream it the right way or... I don't know what... I don't know why we had to trash all those songs. We, maybe we just <laughs> realized, like, eh, this song, just we can do better. Nice. Okay. Like... And we weren't recording anything, so it's like we hadn't gotten to that point where anybody came really knowing any of those songs. Okay. So, but we thought we were getting more into writing more originals. We, we, we wanted it to be primarily original material, but yeah, there's that 
big impediment if um, people don't know it really they're they you're start asking, talking. You're asking for a lot. You're asking a <laughs> lot for to play all these unknown songs, but yeah. we were writing more and more as the Spontanes and um, the new name Spontanes. Na- yeah, all okay. new songs, not very many covers. Uh, I, I don't think, but more originals. And we still thought we needed a front man. And, and but actually, we decided, you know, what we really need is a front woman. Mm. We we auditioned a few people and we thought maybe we needed to be like Blondie or something. Okay. Know, like, I don't know why because we weren't. The talking I mean, I, heads I, were so cool, man. Yeah, and I still wasn't that good of a player, so I don't know how that was going to work. But, <laughs> um, but instead, we got since since it didn't work out with the people we auditioned, um, we realized you know we can't hang around in our rehearsal space. And talk about the things that guys talk about if we have a woman in the band. It's, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to cramp our style. Okay. Our sen- our jokes, <laughs> our sense of humor. So we fun. we pulled John out of retirement. And no hard feelings. He, he hadn't been playing, but we said, John, we don't want you to play bass. We have Ronnie on bass. We want you to just sing. Mm-hmm. And he was okay with that. And I think he must have questioned it. For a while, like really, like, because he had never done that at all. He like never, just sing, just sing, just oh, be wow. a front man. I mean, he hadn't, he wouldn't go near the mic in in the previous bands, uh-huh. and yet we had the sense that, well, he's a really funny guy, right? We love his personality, we love his sense of humor. We've heard him sing when he thought nobody was listening. And he and we, you know, he he is understanding of music. You know, we we we'd spent years together dissecting records and songs and talking about music. We knew that he had the right sensibilities. He was our friend. Sure. So we just like just do it, and he kind of in, I guess he just kind of trial and error invented how he was going to deal with it. Yeah. Because I know some of the early stuff that we recorded. You know, you, you can tell he's still um, trying to figure out what he's what he's doing, and he, he knew he wasn't going to be conventional on stage. He was just going to have to like really throw people off, like like what, ham like, it up re- a bit, or y- yeah, know, but like on unexpected show. stuff. Yeah. Like I'm not, yeah. I, I'm twisting this front man thing, you know, in a yeah. different direction. Pe- people didn't know whether to take him ser- seriously or like it. I don't <laughs> know. We, we liked it because yeah. it, it fit our sense of humor. And I, that was even, I don't think we even had a name for the band right away. So calling it the embarrassment was another way to sort of twist. When did that yeah. come about? Like, did it say uh, how long into you guys, like your first well, gig? Is that when the the name well kind of officially yeah because i mean we we might have played some house parties or something or art art parties celebrity art parties were actually kind of our environment because we're still part of the wichita state art department community and so people would throw these little house parties and well you want us to come and play yeah we'll set up and play we you know we might have done that without having a name early on uh-huh. I th- we must have but it was like early 79 so maybe it was during the winter and it's just a, a, something to do to keep the party going and then uh what he does is really good nuance seance his fiance easy for you to say doc what he does is nice Narcissistic party Artistic party Ha 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 She has a book on the subject of fear in her hand I believe I've walked so hard Artistic party Narcissistic Artistic body. 
see Teresa and well, he's the man in the frame of mind. Don't look at the wood watch, it's swell. Artistic party goer. Narcissistic party goer. Artistic party goer. Narcissistic party on the air at KMUW, which mm-hmm. in those days was sort of a thing you would do after midnight, I guess. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I don't know how many bands did it, really, but but it seemed like, okay, yeah, this is a logical thing to do. A band that has almost never played anywhere yet and doesn't even have a name, and you, you're going to have us play live on the air on the radio station. Uh-huh. Okay, makes perfect sense. So... <laughs> We had to like where the pressure was on. We were practicing, but we we're also thinking we gotta call ourselves. We we were making lists. I wish I'd kept the paper, but we had all these names. Yeah. Anytime, like, what about? Okay, write it down, and we'd have to. Guys, you know, we gotta decide here. It was down to uh, the elastic waistband uh-huh. or the embarrassment. So, I like I like the embarrassment. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, was kind of like. It's like, oh, how can you not go with that? Like, it's really cool. It had like a sound. It had some gravitas. Remember that word? It yeah. had. It felt like it had some weight to it. But on the other hand, it was completely ridiculous. And so it, yeah, it fit perfectly. It and it, you know how everyone tries to make plural out of their name. So whatever it is, it's oh, the Beatles, yeah. oh, yeah. Rolling Stones. But you guys were in the embarrassment. Yeah, cause, well, because we're thinking <laughs> like the there was a 60s group, The Association, just singular, mm-hmm. you know. And it was like, oh, well, they sound like they're like they've got their they're very professional. <laughs> <laughs> they're smart. The Associate. It sounds very business like. So, yes. yes, we're the embarrassment. Yeah. So, OK, that's 1979. You guys are just skidding. You've just uh, like I mean, you've been working on this thing. And as different versions of it, and you're still you're still doing art at WSU, and yeah, I think um, yeah, it's it got to where I was the only one still taking classes. I was very committed to finishing my degree, but I guess I could, for a while I couldn't remember like what happened to everybody else. Why they drop out? And it might have just come down to the fact that um, it was the cost. Mm. of still going to classes because right. um, the other guys just like, yeah, you know, I got to work and uh, it's too expensive. But I was able to juggle that. I was working at Henry's too with, where my dad was working. I was part-time because I, I remember writing when it, when it was slow on the sales floor, I would be writing songs. Oh, really? On, on little notepads, yeah. Nice. Which was productive. Double, double win. You're getting paid yeah. to write songs. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Well, but yeah, I'd, I could write out lyrics and and then bring them into rehearsal. And but we did a, a whole lot of 
rehearsing too. I mean, that was our, I don't think anybody had a social life. I think we were. That was your every night kind of thing. You yeah, we were dinner. so driven, had it in our heads that if, you know, if we are really serious about this, this is going to lead somewhere. Yeah. I don't know why, because we hadn't even made a record yet. So, you know, until until late 79, well, I guess this is still within that first year, because mm -hmm. this came together early 79, you know, we got the name, we were on the radio, so we were getting an audience in town, Yeah, and it, it was like, oh, people seem to be having fun, we're having fun, we were getting more songs written, and we were still like throwing out earlier ones, like, yeah, we can do better than that, so our our level of songwriting was increasing and by the time we got to go into the studio at the end of 79 and you know at at our expense of course but we thought well, we've got a handful of songs here now that we think are worth recording right and that you know we we knew like just the one goal was okay to to get anywhere further than we are now we have to have an actual physical record and we see all these punk bands all over the place, putting out 45s with mm -hmm. a picture sleeve. And, you know, sure, most of them have record labels behind them. And some of them are like major record labels, but some of them are not. Some people are doing it all independently, and yet you can still find those records. So we mm -hmm. thought, well, we can do that at least. Right. You know, we can at least be on that level. So that. Your first album. Big, no, just a first, just a forty-five, 45 just the first single. Yeah, thing. And, and it was. And you what know, was that? That was. Uh, we didn't even know what, like, what was going to be the, the main, the A side versus the B side. Right. So we we, uh, we chose Sex Drive and Patio Set, to be on the forty-five. Letting people decide, like, well, let's let people figure out which song they think is the one to play and mm -hmm. it immediately became like sex drive even though it was too long how long fit. was it i think it was like a five minute recording and we mm -hmm. thought well that's not really what it's supposed to be for airplay but what whatever it's yeah. punk right but we'd actually sold we licensed a track f from that first session um so we didn't we didn't go right into putting out the 45 we were shopping the songs around to the few contacts we thought like if if somebody's going to make a record of this like are we going to have to do it or can we get somebody and you know these pre way before internet days um uh, it was like what what was on the records that we were buying by going to Kansas City or by you know sending away mail order stuff uh one label was Bomp Records in California was they had a magazine which which we were reading about new music and they were putting out some stuff on their own label kind of cool stuff even like Iggy some Iggy pop indie stuff because we were into him but he had lost his uh, label support because he mm. hadn't you know been selling a lot of records and um, so we sent them the songs and we got you know nice comments but and they said you know we're not going to put out your record or anything but one of these songs is a cover yeah we did four originals and one cover of an old uh, 60s garage band the seeds mm -hmm. pushing too hard yeah. and they said oh this is perfect for a, an album we're putting out called battle of the garages where you know we've already got all these garage bands doing their versions of songs and we think it fit right in there and right. so we thought wow so we're going to be on an album like a compilation uh, album with yeah, different, with, yeah with bands we've never heard of of course yeah but no one's heard of us and it'll be <laughs> cool. pretty well distributed so we thought well that's a good sign that what we recorded is okay they didn't they didn't care for our original songs enough but we thought they were good enough yeah and because we didn't think the cover version was you know anything better than our originals really but but it was familiar so there you go but then we yeah nothing happened to where anybody else was going to put it out so we realized okay we gotta you know spend a lot of 1980 
putting out a 45 ourselves and then right. getting it distributed. So I don't know that year. I don't know how that year went by pretty well, but we must have gotten enough gigs and stuff based on just building a reputation or right. Cause still, and you do get a lot better. Like as a band, you can watch a band who's brand new play their first set at Kirby's and then they go on the road, let's say, yeah. and then they come back from the road and that's a different band playing yeah. usually. Yeah. And maybe since as far as playing Wichita, it was going to be the same core crowd. Yeah. All I don't know how often we were even able to get away with playing in town because, you know, it'd be an audience of people who were willing to come and hear uh, original, pretty rough music. <laughs> but but the ener- I think people started to get caught up in the energy of it and, yeah. and maybe the word spread it's like oh check you got to check this out this is fun it's danceable it's what's happening everywhere yeah, else cool. yeah. yeah and so we could keep busy maybe, maybe we started to play out of town like at least, lawrence at least like lawrence and in kansas city without having a record out yet although logically that doesn't it doesn't seem like it would have worked that way but it it, it must have because we kept pretty darn busy in 1980 and the record couldn't have come out that fast but right so then you but, did finally get an, a, an album out in 81 uh, right yeah well, it was only an ep it looked it looked big yeah it looked like a regular song it looked yeah. what was it called uh uh somebody thought of this name the embarrassment ep <laughs> oh, very pre- original kudos to that um <laughs> and it had our our uh printmaking professor's artwork on front and back Oh, right. But, um, yeah, we got his permission. He didn't have to do anything for us. It was just, hey, these two prints of yours, they're kind of like opposite. Yeah. So we use one on the front, one on the back. We don't want to have a, again, we didn't want to have a front or back. Kind of like the 45, we couldn't decide what was the the first side. But the EP was just a two-sided short collection of songs so it had like four or six songs on it five songs total okay because one of them was long enough to be uh, take up a little more room but yeah. you know maximum we were uh trying to appeal to the audio files then like you don't want to squeeze the grooves too close we, we wanted to have it play at 45 rpm mm-hmm. and and just have you know limited amount of music information on there so it would sound really good it was mastered really well i think we we managed to select the right person and pay enough money to get it professionally done that so that we knew it would be loud and bold and big and crisp i think yeah and i think people were surprised that we got such a good result out of it but again we had to pretty much do it everything ourselves sure we had that's, a little help. That's, I think that's but, part of the fun of it, probably, learning it and co- we, collaborating and. Yeah, we learned the business learned from the ground, the uh, but it got distributed. I mean, it, it surprisingly it, it kept up pretty well with like bigger releases of the time. Oh really? It, it would show up in like reviews uh well well, wherever you'd look for the press like to gauge like how well is this going to do um it would show up you know back to back in reviews with what rem was doing at the time even though they had the backing of i think irs records already i think was was producing or printing and pressing and distributing their stuff and we were we didn't have any of that and we, we would look like we were on equal level with bigger releases. And, and for radio cool. airplay, we, you would gauge it from college radio, which was a huge network across the country. Um, but the only, only way we'd know to keep up is that we had developed uh, communication via mail pretty much Mm -hmm. with with all these radio stations so they would send us playlists in the mail just had to come in the mail and you'd see that oh my god look at that they they put us in you know heavy rotation right there with you know so and so and so it's like wow they they are cool yeah our record is like making a big 
showing. And so that instantly that meant, you know, getting gigs in all these Getting calls city, and things cities like that. where where they had a good radio station that that made such a huge difference in those days because that was well that was what made Lawrence such a great place to play and and of course it still is but we sort of learned through that that oh that's why we can play in Boston and New yeah. York and Columbus out of all the places in Ohio you know yeah particularly Columbus because it's such a college town and it had a great radio station chicago of course for many reasons but other like small places just because they had really hip college radio stations right and the people you knew you to. already when you got there yeah so they'd heard cool. the record so you know then that's what made the big difference but so okay so and, and you guys went on for three more years, where you were, you've got signed to a major label? No. no. You never got signed to no, a major label? No, no. That's what... But I mean, it that... seemed like you were signed, like, in my opinion, because everyone just... What was your, what was your most famous album? Was it the EP? Um, I guess the, the follow-up got more press. You know, it had some... We had some momentum. Yeah. So we got... People were ready for the next thing to come along, um, and I don't think it disappointed people. So I think it grew the band in that way, but not enough for us to be able to survive the the wear and tear. Yeah, of, we we had we were spending way too much time on the road. Um, and so we were less productive. We weren't writing as much. Mm -hmm. That was a really bad sign. Uh, uh, yeah, that should have been a big red flag there. But um, you guys we went really had to no Europe choice. and things. No, so. not the embarrassment. No, no? My, my later band did, but um, the embarrassment mostly just kept going to the East Coast. And what was the and the, the North and and Big Dipper? Right? Yeah, that was my Boston. Well. That's because the embarrassment folded. I mean, even though the the newest record had been doing, I mean, getting us all kinds of new attention in '83, mm -hmm. and even an offer of a uh, like we would have gone on our biggest tour in '83, but um, it wasn't enough of an incentive. I think we we had we had the interest of a a higher level uh, tour, a booking agency. Mm -hmm. I didn't know much about those operations yet until until later myself. But mm -hmm. but um, it would have you know gotten us into a better circuit of touring and stuff like that. But we really just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> we just had, tired. Uh, yeah, war and, and and we yeah so tired that we just really couldn't think straight like uh, this is just too this, it took it just took too it's big of grueling, a toll right i mean it's like traveling playing a hard you know yeah there there was no uh glamour to the way we were doing it right at that level you know we were playing rough places and we were traveling you know shoestring we had no no budget at all and because we were just trying to survive uh, uh, you couldn't hold on to a much of a job mm -hmm. because you were going to be gone too much, and yet we couldn't make enough money to pay for keeping apartments back here. Right. Uh, it's just too too many things. So we gave it up, and I went to Boston um, to get back into painting. Really. Um, so what? Where did been, you go? I had had to put my painting on hold. I I knew I wasn't done with it, but I went to. I had a I had the option, I narrowed it down to uh, three places I would have gone to, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. that, uh, they had a good art program to get a master's. Is that what yeah. you were going to do? Or Bloomington University in in Indianapolis, or no, in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm sorry, in, Indiana University in Bloomington. I think is okay properly, and. I had 
researched enough that I thought, oh, they got a really great art department. But Boston University had the best, and the embarrassment had played pretty often in Boston and just loved the city, Mm -hmm. loved the history of it. So that appealed to me on so many different levels that knowing that I could afford to go there, and I was lucky, I just... um, I had to break up with my longtime girlfriend, but that probably needed to happen anyway because I was incapable of of being a functioning partner, right? Relationship partner. I'm not good at that at all, and uh, so I needed to be on my own. Packed up the car, the Sunbird. Sunbird. All right. Pontiac Sunbird hatchback. <laughs> Stere- obviously the stereo fit in there and some records and a albums. bunch of records yeah but I, I was able to leave a lot of stuff in my parents basement for 30 years and um 30 went, years you yeah, left it there 30 yeah, landed so in did boston. you live in boston for 30 years i lived in massachusetts then for 30 years i you went did. from near the campus when i first got to town did you uh, get the master's degree you got the master's oh degree. in uh, what exactly in, in painting just um, straight up painting yeah it awesome. says that on i think it says that on the on the document fine master arts of painting. fine arts painting oh my uh, goodness Bill, you would I think that know. would land me a good job Heck right? yeah. uh, <laughs> no then i found out uh, yeah all my fellow students <laughs> master, but, so what do you get yeah, oh yeah well um yeah of course i'm gonna go i'm gonna get a teaching job i'm gonna be a, a college art professor Oh yeah, well, that's what I'm gonna do too. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I was like the only one. That, um, guys, I, I was just planning on being an artist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was working uh, <laughs> graveyard shift in the supermarket. Yeah. Stocking shelves. Also playing in the Big Dipper band. Well, right? not, I no? didn't. I had no intention of playing music. So you were you I, were totally studying on studying, studying paint. art. Art. Uh, Brent followed me out there, and right away was recruited by this band Del Fuegos that we had played with twice on our that's a cool name trips. And Del Fuegos were about to sign a record deal, and and Brent. Looks like, yeah, we know how great a drummer you are. You know, you, the embarrassment was great. We loved you guys. You be our drummer, and we got a record deal, and we're going on. And he just, psh, he, yeah, he came out, like, just following me, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll come out to Boston with you and hangs around, you know, picks up a, a girl at, in my graduate program mm-hmm. that starts dating one of my fellow graduate students, like the cutest one. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm still, like, too shy to even talk to her and okay way to go brent and then joins this rock band and he's off touring the world uh amazing uh, ends up you know living in hollywood with his uh hollywood wife for a while um wow but uh it's you know cool. his dreams came true in a, in a way you know there's a long story to that too but his sure. his dream came true there and he he deserved it and uh I stuck with like nope, I'm done with music. That you know, I had my fill of that. You I'm, were burnt I'm all out, about art, huh? <laughs> and yeah, it took two years. And learned a lot. Learned a lot, which good and bad. I mean, yeah. it, it gave me some skills for the long term, but it really messed me up. I started becoming all these different art heroes that i had in succession like oh i'm gonna be vincent van gogh no i'm gonna be uh the german expressionist uh ernst ludwig kirchner <laughs> i'm gonna be him and like uh, taking on their persona their art style their art style it's mm. like oh and i couldn't do any i couldn't do any of it justice and so i went from like arriving as this promising painter with sort of a you know, a, a, a developed skill. And I had already sold paintings before. You know, I had been a professional artist. I, I had exhibited in Wichita galleries and sold my work. I thought, yeah, I, you know, I could be a professional artist. I, I, 
I planned on being single so that if I was starving, it wasn't going to affect anybody else. It's just me. It's like I can, I I will sacrifice. I don't mind. I don't care about things. I'm not a materialistic person. I just want to do what I think I should be doing. Right. But, you want to uh, be happy. Yeah. But I ended up, by the time I finished school, I was doing really crappy art and. Like what? Like what do you mean? Uh, well, how do I, how do I describe it? Yeah, I mean, how do you describe the it? paintings were just, um, I mean, like they just weren't your personal they, style. So they, you're no, just, they weren't, they were attempts at other expressionism without, without any focus. And, and I had gotten so out of my element that I, I was one of those artists who couldn't finish a painting and I'd be pacing the floor, mm. you know, and then oh, I'm going to completely paint over this and redo it, you know, <laughs> and, and oh, I thought things had to be big, you know, it was, yeah. I was brainwashed by the university, the, the power, yeah, the university, the academic, academic knowledge that I'm supposed to be in awe of or something like, Oh, I have to do it this way. I even had a studio visit from, uh, Robert De Niro Sr., who at the time <laughs> seemed old, but he, of course, now he he's, he was a lot younger than De Niro the actor is now, but he was a well-established artist in New York, studio artist, gallery artist, and he was Did making he the rounds. Like yeah, son? he re looked exactly like That's what I yeah, thought. You, I you, think I've seen him before. Yeah, so he, he came around and did studio visits. You know, they had visiting artists because BU had that, you know, name they could pull in people and uh so he had a private one-on-one -on -one in my studio and and i was getting some good feedback and encouragement for kind of for what was natural to me but i was not taking that advice and using i wasn't putting it to good use i was insisting on going off into these experimental periods and i just i got myself depressed and anxious and non-productive and uh my the solution was to give up oil painting completely and i i set myself up with uh uh portable supplies of watercolors mm -hmm. and i i started just walking around the all of boston with my watercolors and setting up and painting plein air watercolor paintings okay to but i was teaching myself as i was doing it i was really clumsy with it but i also got used to people watching me paint so that was kind of a nice thing to get used to because mm -hmm. at first that was it very intimidating that, uh shyness out of you it, a little. it helped me overcome because people will talk with you when you're painting and they'll yeah, ask you and questions. i didn't mind that i liked sharing that uh mm -hmm. yeah because i think even yeah, even through that whole embarrassment uh, band thing, I was still uh, very shy. That didn't do anything for my shyness. It didn't? Anything. So I, I was still very shy. I did have a girlfriend from the uh, graduate students. Uh -huh. well, I hit it off really well with this uh, young woman who was more from Boston. Uh -huh. We had very different backgrounds, but she was into music too, and... Um, in fact, she ended up starting an all-girl band later in the 80s after when we were both finished with school. But she coincidentally uh, uh, introduced me to this guy that she'd been working. Part Her part-time job was in a pharmacy. And um, she found out that the, the, the young guy that she was working with was a guitarist in another band uh -huh. playing some clubs. She took me to see him and, and he was an embarrassment fan. Oh, cool. Somehow it's like, Oh, he was that cool that he actually knew our <laughs> music, even though he's surrounded by, you know, the Boston music scene was like held in very high regard. Right. Like, next to New York. It's like second to New York maybe, but like, Oh man, so much good stuff coming out of Boston. And he was playing with a guy who had been in a very well-known Boston band, but he wasn't happy about it. Um, 
<laughs> right away, he told me. So we, yeah, we got together. She introduced us, and we were both like, "Let's make it clear." Yeah, I don't want to start a band with you. I'm all done. I don't want to be in a band. It's been nothing but miserable. It's no fun. <laughs> but if you want to just hang out and Play talk, music. you know, write songs together. How about that? You like we're both into writing. Oh yeah. We'll just hang out and maybe we'll write some songs. Yeah. And that's what we were determined to do. And it, that became Big Dipper. We, <laughs> we ended up touring, yeah, Europe. And we ended up getting signed to a major record label. And I, I became the front man in the band by default because originally it was supposed to be. Wow. Well, you know, <laughs> he got his his bass player friend to join in and his cousin to play drums and, and – uh, it was okay. His cousin was the kid, didn't care about writing songs, but the bass player was already like another wannabe songwriter. So, like, okay, we have three songwriters. We'll just have this healthy, like, we'll share our song ideas and we'll help each other. We'll collaborate as needed if you want me to help you with your song. If not, you know, bring it in and teach us how to play it. We'll, we'll help flesh it out, arrange mm -hmm. it, whatever. And we can all sing our own songs if we want. Sing uh, back up or something. Yeah, and we'll add harmonies, yep. you know, whatever. It and then by default, I kind of ended up being the usual f front man. <laughs> <laughs> so little by little, I tried to, I tried to adapt to that. Thinking like, what what would John Nichols do? Like, <laughs> I've been, I've watched, you know, I've watched somebody kind of figure this out. Can I just figure this out? I don't think I ever figured it out oh well, i don't but, know um it, I, I think you do i think you do have a great persona stage uh, persona that you put on <laughs> um well I, I, what i did find out in retrospect um because we now we had fun for a while we actually had a lot of fun in the in the 80s doing this in boston we we recorded a lot which was the the best time uh, but we we also got to travel a lot, so I got to see a lot of places that I wouldn't have seen, like over in Europe. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, by by doing the band thing, uh, but I realized that uh, it wasn't until we had a chance, well, after long time of being all done with this, finally, um, you know, decades even. We played together in the late 2000s and in the early 2010s, like two, 2012. Probably 2013 was the last time. Ten years ago already was the last time. But um, I found out then that I was at a much better point in my life that I could appreciate in in the moment in the present performing on stage and, mm -hmm. and having, you know, feeling like I, I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate to be able to do this. Not a lot of people get to do this with friends and, and playing music that you actually wrote together. You created this together and playing it for people who actually even already like this music. And they're so happy to be, seeing you play it or hearing it, what it's like right. this is just a really incredible and rare experience and i better appreciate it while i'm Able, having while right? i'm here yeah and i found out i had so much more fun on stage with that attitude and uh, and i tried to make sure that i like made that clear and expressed that it was like this is way better than it used to, like when you're struggling up and coming like oh, we need to you know yeah <laughs> we gotta get our break band we gotta impress these people oh so you know. much pressure <laughs> yeah it was so stressful yeah and i had no idea because i didn't have anything to compare it to but to to be able to do it again and not feel the i mean there's some pressure like yeah. you, am i going to remember but right but right. it's nothing like it was it it's maybe, more joy than it is and pain. i and i realized well that's that's how music should always be that you sh it should always have that place in your life you know honestly yeah. um but yeah. I, I didn't grow up in a family where we got out instruments and sat around and played unfortunately you know my my dad could have 
<laughs> kind of led us into that. But like I said, you know, he was afraid. He didn't really want a music career. He had he had this guitar in the house that he never showed me anything about it. Really? But it was it it was a it was an electric Gibson, but it was the design I found out when I finally understood enough about guitars. It was really designed to just be a Hawaiian slide guitar. Oh. You okay. put it on your lap. I mean, it looks fairly like a conventional electric guitar, but, right? But you were supposed to just play it on your lap. Like real high a, action and yeah, and it's fascinating. Um, I tried to experiment with it, but <laughs> then he got rid of it. <laughs> so I didn't grow up with that way of experiencing music. So I, and I didn't raise my son much with that either. I, I wish I didn't really ha feel like I knew enough about it even then. My son's uh, approaching thirty now. Mm. Um, okay, he he came along after the big Is Dipper he the thing fourth ended. Bill? No, okay. no, his wondering. mother would never would have gone for that. <laughs> uh, now you and your you and your wife play but, music though. Well, see, that's when it finally that and see, I met my current wife in two thousand ten, okay. and that was that. This was. The same time when I was so finally you're... understanding that the place for music for me is to just experiencing, just experience the joy of it as you're doing it, whether it's the writing element or the performing or just sitting around at home. Mm. So um, I had had some of those reunion shows with Big Dipper, which had helped me understand that, and they weren't going to be ongoing. And I was mm -hmm. doing some solo writing and demo recording. For no reason other than just like, I like putting these songs together, and mm -hmm. I know I'm not going to do anything with them. Nobody cares what I'm doing. And then I meet uh, Carly. Uh, I, uh, well, I'd been divorced for a while. My son, right, your son, son was scared. still in middle school. Okay. At that at that point, not quite in high school, and uh, so I was still trying to be, you know, a good responsible parent. But I, I needed to meet. I needed. I needed a relationship, mm -hmm. and my wife and I had we we didn't have a relationship other than co-parenting anymore. Mm -hmm. So I met Carly, and she knew nothing about any of my previous history, nor did she care. It's like I don't care that you were in a band. I'm not impressed. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not your groupie. Uh, That's kind of good though. Yeah, it was, it was great, and because then I found out she wrote poetry. Like, oh, what do you, what do you like to do? Oh, I write poems. And I have a keyboard. Sometimes I tinker around on that. I said, we could write songs together. She said, yeah. well, I've never written a song. I, it's, it's, it's really, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. We'll just take some of your poems and, you know, we'll experiment with it. But, yeah. you know, let me see if I can put music to some of your poetry. Or we'll just come up, we'll start writing new things together. Right. And think of it in terms of phrasing and melody and that just became our bonding, right? Our, our dating experience was like, we'll write and demo and and then perform. And that, she was like, "Are you sure you want?" Like, <laughs> she sings really good though. I've never done anything like this before. Like, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, it'll be fun. Let's just. And she was so brave, willing yeah. to put herself out there with no experience. Thought, yeah, you're a good partner. Yeah. This. And you're and, painting during that time too, right? Oh, I, mean, I was getting back into oils. But yeah, my my time with watercolors that I meant I mentioned, like I had to I had to leave oils behind and and do something that I thought was me. So I spent like through the 80s and 90s just painting watercolors. Small plein air still, or yeah, all plein air, uh -huh. um, and it got to where I I think I got really good. Because I developed the skill and the practice of watercolors, um, right? And That's I studied, hard. I studied some masters that were very accessible in the museums in uh, in and around Boston. I was studying uh, Winslow Homer watercolors and even some wow. Edward Hopper. A lot of I guess people don't always think of him as watercolors, but he did he did a lot of plein air watercolors up and stuff. down the coast. Yeah. Because he was living in New England and landscapes, uh, yeah, houses, even some of those watercolor subjects that you know became, I mean, lighthouses that became you know major um, 
Acrylic landscapes of, yeah. of his, but he was doing those kind of areas in watercolor in his in his car. He and his wife oh, would wow. drive around, and they had this big sedan, big enough that you know one in the front seat, one in the back seat, with their big they board both, and their they watercolor. Both they both paint. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, because he would include her sometimes in the painting, so that's how you knew that she was sitting in the front seat painting. doing her painting because <laughs> he's got her. He's that's watching cool. from the back. So all these studies, and and I was able to look at all that stuff firsthand, close up, yeah. and really see what the techniques were because there was a lot more to it. It yeah. wasn't all just like fresh dabs of 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 watercolor and then leave it be. Some of it was like really worked into, like really tough stuff. And, yeah. and I thought, oh, you can do a lot with watercolor. So I I explored that, but uh, I became a father in the 90s, so I, I um, was a stay-at-home dad, and so I stopped painting pretty much completely. Yeah, you have and to. It, as soon as I, yeah, I was very committed. You couldn't be Being a parent on. was the hardest job, obviously, that I'd ever done because I'd been sort of a irresponsible adult up until that point, you know, because a free you know, a free to do yeah, whatever because remember want. Yeah. like you know i when i left wichita i was like oh i'm just gonna do whatever i want it's not gonna affect anybody else it's, it's just gonna be me well right. something clicked in my head where it's like you know what i think i'm i'm supposed to be a father yeah and and i know that's a big responsibility i'm not going to take it lightly so uh well luckily then my wife was a uh, very successful small business owner Uh but she had to work at that all the time so naturally me being the starving artist it was like well who's gonna watch the kid yeah (laughs) it's not gonna be the starving artist those days are done so uh i i stopped painting and that was fine i loved you know being the parent of my little boy and and then uh, as soon as he was old enough for school i went and started teaching and I found out my uh, master's degree was actually still worth something. It's it was even like, worth more. Well, you it? don't have a teaching degree, but I guess you know your subject matter. We'll, you know, we we can hire you. So I, I was I got and a teaching. And then you get a certificate. Yeah, I I got some sort of initial license to teach in the mm-hmm. public schools without any teaching degree degree or teaching education i had had no classes in teaching wild i was like wow that, that, i was walking in but I, I didn't you were a good teacher i think i was um because you well, don't for, for my massachusetts period which was ended up being 12 years of of uh well, i did teach some college courses um at first uh-huh. but i found out they only wanted adjunct professor that was like i well i can't even get insurance for my family yeah adjunct is like, like uh basically what is it like a contract or, yeah. or something and that was i thought well that's an appropriate use of my 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 degree and my skill level and my knowledge and I was comfortable teaching college courses I, well i can i can share all my knowledge for with these undergrads it's great but the money was horrible and the, you know, no benefit. So um, I sought out a public school elementary. In Boston? It, well, in, a, in more of a, not sub, a, suburb. a separate town. There's so many towns jam-packed between Are they Boston, townships or they're, are they're, they like Some of them are else. cities and some of them are just town. This is the town of Weymouth I was okay. in. I, I subbed for a year in like three different towns. And then, just to like just to understand the the environment, and that was scary as hell. And then um, I applied for a full time position, and it turned out to be in Weymouth. One of the, I think that was one of the places I had subbed in anyway. So um, maybe that's maybe I had some good letters of recommendation or something. But anyway, they hired me, and and I started to have a reputation as like a. Well, the classroom teachers would would observe me teaching because sometimes I'd be on a cart, so I'd uh-huh, have to do yeah, it in yeah. front of them in their room on a cart. On a cart, and they very, were like, "Oh gosh, stretchy. I really like the way you, I I like the way you, 
are with the student, you you remind me so much of Mr. Rogers. So I'd wear the cardigans and a tie and you take on the persona. Oh yeah, like a very calm and gentle. I tell you, I could never get away with that in the public schools now. I'm sorry to say, but no. I would be eaten alive. Eaten, yeah, I'd be trampled to death. Oh, I don't know. Uh. Well, I just, it was Halloween the other day, and we had a lot of trick-or-treaters over here. Yeah? And they were all very kind. Oh, thank goodness. Tell, I, I need to hear good news. I was super happy about that. I need to hear good news. Like I was that, thinking cause... they were going to be rude and pushing each other out of the way and, you know, how you see on TV. Okay. Uh, no, they were good. just well, gentle, yeah. kind. They said, please. They said, thank you. They they held each other's hands as they walked down the steps so the little ones didn't fall. And What sort of neighborhood is this? It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. We need to get well, out of here. Well, um, <laughs> no, yeah, then, thank you for stopping me from going down that ne- negative road. I don't want to be negative, but... Um, yeah, they'll eat you a lot. I had a really I, good I experience teaching... 12 years in Weymouth and um, and I probably would have kept doing it longer I might have retired at this point anyway but I left there uh, in 2013 so. and came back here to Wichita yeah that's that is that when the, the pivotal moment. is that when you got divorced it had nothing to do with the divorce. No, um, I had already been divorced for several years. I was uh-huh. with Carly there for three for you know since 2010. Uh-huh. I'd been with Carly, and we we in fact moved into a an apartment not far from the um, the coast. We were in the town of Hull, Massachusetts. Cool. And yeah, very cool town, like a surfside. I like surf big side. beach community. Eating lobster rolls and stuff. Uh, you could clam rolls, More lobster clam rolls, water. but nobody really wanted them to. My wife hates seafood. <laughs> she grew up there. <laughs> she hates seafood. Um, it's weird. <laughs> so yeah, I get uh, it though. If you have something too much, it's too much of a good thing is a bad yeah, thing. And I'm gluten free, so. We were cooking at home, and <laughs> we both like to cook. Do you have Especially, celiacs? Is that why you're no? Cooking? I'm just I no. I found out in the '80s, while I was literally a starving artist, and I was uh, trying to spend as little on groceries as possible. I started to wonder why do I feel so horrible all the time? Why do I have no energy? Mm. You're just realizing, eating crackers and bread all day. Oh, you know, pasta and bread. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was eating it's white cheap, flour right? and and drinking caf- caffeine and sugar, and wondering why I felt so lousy. Okay. And I realized when I changed my diet, it, it, more it vegetables. Wasn't easy. Yeah. Uh, no, I had to go through a complete process uh, guided by a book at the time, which uh-huh. was came came into my awareness luckily probably saved my life but i realized that oh i had to completely change the way i was eating and rethink you know what food does and it it uh brought my energy back and, that's good that's good because uh, yeah, you had because so, okay so anyway i i got uh, off the topic but uh but, you're coming back or 13 years ago you came back to wichita is that right? Yeah, we came back uh, as newlyweds. Uh, Carly and I had just got married, and we just had started re- um, taking care of, of uh, I can say, our granddaughter once we became married. But before we were married, it was her granddaughter of her her adult daughter. She she already had an adult daughter and son when I met her, and and um, my son was still you know in high school and. And, uh, so, but she was, you know, on, on her own, she was divorced and she was on her own, but, um, this little baby was in the picture and we started Okay, the take, baby was in Boston? In, well, in that area. We were living or d- all, Hull, all or, these different little towns yeah. and stuff, but, but, um, we, we moved out here with, um, some of the rest of the family in tow. Okay. But we came out to take care of my dad. Your dad was fallen um, he was getting older he was, and... yeah he was having he was the last one my mom had been gone for uh 12 years by that time and he was he's doing a remarkable job you know he was long 
been retired yeah. and um and he knew he had to take care of himself and he was doing pretty pretty good but he really had undiagnosed dementia okay and he and you know it was confusing um and difficult he didn't know why he was struggling with some stuff and we we didn't we couldn't figure it out for a long time either but he needed help and and it it was for the best. It came down to us yeah. to step up. Uh, I'm thankful that she, Carly was willing to like drop everything. She's got a huge family um, out in Massachusetts, uh-huh. and and she had always been surrounded with that, and that that was her support. Plus the geography, uh, the environment of Massachusetts was crucial to her sanity, and and you know. Uh, offsetting the stress of work and everything like that i took her away from all that or she was willing to give all that up and come and help as long as her little granddaughter could come right too and yeah and even her daughter uh her daughter came along but um our commitment in marriage was that we would take care of all of our family members right no matter what and that would be our priority so we lived we tried to follow through on that we came out here and your dad he li- is he still he, alive or? no he lived until the end of 2017 okay so we we were able to help him through uh transition to uh a, a, um like, nursing home that, okay it was kind of a rough tra- transition for a bit he didn't want to leave his condo but um that had to happen eventually, and then he, it was very difficult in the nursing home as things got a lot worse, and he wasn't properly diagnosed. I wish more people would um, get help with this, but we learned about Lewy body dementia only literally a week before he died of it. it, it is that Robin Williams? Yes, okay. we found out because you know immediately we start doing research. It's like, oh my God, there's you know there's a whole lot of information here, but it's often undiagnosed. It's difficult to diagnose early, and yet they identify these four stages of it, and it which was were like really e- oh, it's like oh, oh yeah. well that explains a whole lot. Yeah. But it wasn't until the f- the final time that the nursing home. Threw up their hands. Uh, you know, having him in a nursing home still meant that my wife had to become a full-time caregiver. I went back to teaching uh-huh. full-time, which I thought I was done with. Out here, and, and she, because one of us had to oversee his nursing home care or it wasn't going to be handled right. And this right. was in the best nursing home that we could arrange for him. You know, we, we were yeah. doing our research. And he and and still they yet. like we can't take we don't know what to do we can't we're not equipped for this we can't manage him you've got to take him to up to this clinic or take him here so, you know we don't know what to do it, the last time we had to take him to uh, whichever Saint Hospital is the one on East Harry because I get them all mixed up it's either Joseph or okay. Joseph. Because St. Uh, Francis, think about it, St. Francis Street. On Francis Street. Thank you. Mm. I'll remember that now forever. St. <laughs> Joseph is just like a little aspirin or something. St. Joe. Oh. Well, anyway, so <laughs> we go there, emergency room. Like, well, what's wrong? I mean, we checked him out, and we don't have any reason to keep him here. Well, the nursing home doesn't want him. And finally, the doctor on duty... Um. Come, comes in and talks to us. Oh, and my wife had already for weeks been saying to the nursing home, we think he needs hospice care. Uh-huh. We, we, you know, we think it's at this point now. Uh, we don't want to do more. And, and they were saying, the, but the nursing home was saying, no, he, he wouldn't qualify for that. He's not ready for that. So it, nothing was happening. They wouldn't help us with that. So mm-hmm. this doctor comes in and says, yeah, your father's like stage four Louis body dementia. He's not going to make it too much longer. He, yeah. he needs hospice care immediately. Like, 
well, this is what we've been trying to do. And nobody has even ever told us this term, this diagnosis before. Yeah. And this guy here, he's so sure of it. And not only that, but he's like the big head of this one hospice provider in town. Yeah. That my wife already knew about. She said, well, yeah. Harry been, Hines or something like that. I don't, maybe. I don't know now. And, but the very next day, it's like, we, we'll keep him, we'll keep your dad overnight. We got to discharge him tomorrow, but we'll send him back to Catholic care and you will have hospice care starting tomorrow. Uh huh. And sure enough, you know, they the, the, the they assign this woman to come and she thinks she's going to be there like for some short time to do some, you know, official stuff, the first steps that they take. She ends up realizing she's got to spend the whole day trying to figure out like what to do for my dad. And it was steadily downhill. We were with him the rest of the week. Like move a cot into his room. We're staying here. We're 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 staying in his room all night long because he won't stay in bed otherwise. He'll and get up and we'll he'll run, get up walk and away. just get on the floor. He'll just like lay on the floor. He wants to be on the floor. He's out of his. He's not yeah. rational at all, uh-huh. and, and he's non-communicative now. And uh. and you know just one thing after another. And by yeah by the Friday, we were watching him take his. We're right there watching him take his last breath. Uh. Dad, we've been with you all week. You know. You've been a good like, dad. Yeah. You know. It was amazing. And then I realized, like, okay, this is why we moved back here. Yeah. We had to be here for be here. this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're lucky like, to be able to actually be there for that I, moment, that's, I feel that's like. That's how I felt. Like, okay, I mean, this is this is part of life yeah it's the very family. last part you know like so many people don't get to do this or so many people probably don't want, don't to. want to be yeah, in this position yeah. but i know it was hard but i feel like this was the right thing and, yeah and this is something important to do and we wanted our kids and our grandkids to know that like this is what you do yeah. In this situation. And that's really all you can do because you can't control anyone else. You can yeah. only set the, uh, set the tone. Because, you know, because then yeah. we're telling, like, our granddaughter, like, so, you know, when uh, <laughs> grandma gets, when grandma and grandpa are in this position, you know what you're going to be doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not going to be my job, is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You're going to be the one. And we're not even going to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, my my no. wife thinks she's like because I'm 13 years older than her. That uh-huh. was so. At the outset, that was like, oh wait a minute, you're going to be like I'm going to be taking care of you. Who's going to be taking care of me? Well, that's that's what we're training the, our granddaughter for. Like, yeah. Okay, so they they live here. You live here yeah. in Wichita. You do your art here, like your mate. Cut cut from that pivotal moment in your life to you make a living now selling your art, which is a miracle too. And it wouldn't it would not have happened, awesome. but for some of the some of the things that happened that I didn't think were a good thing to have happen. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I I. I not counting coming back to Wichita, that was a good and important, that was the right, I say that, you know, I think it was the best decision, but it had consequences too. I left my son behind while he was still finishing high school in Massachusetts, and I didn't see him a lot. And Did that hurt and your relationship? Even, it, it, it severed it for a time. Really? Actually, yeah. We had a big falling out, uh, and it was terrible. It was very, it hurt a lot. And you know, it's it's been mended now, but it's like, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, but, like tough decisions. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I but I, I, you know, I don't know what else. Like, I don't know what we could have done different. I could have, yeah, I could have been a better father through that period. I was angry at his mother. Yeah, you know so much too that it, and he, you know, he ha- really had no choice for a lot of his life but to 
always take his mother's word and, and advice. And, you know, she, she was a very good, she gave him a lot of great opportunities and mm. stuff like that. Um, so it's natural that he would trust Men, her choices. Boys always like go that. for their moms more anyway. Yeah. But, um, That's just the way it is. Yeah, so I felt like I didn't mean that much to, to him, but, you know, I let myself take, accept that position instead of fighting mm -hmm. to, to make it otherwise. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't like confrontation. Yeah. And, uh, but I also got really ill, uh, medically. And when you and came back here or yeah, when you were there? Yeah, no, back here. And there were a lot of factors uh there's a combination of factors too my my dad's situation the the job that i took to try to support us through that time was that teaching the teaching job okay. was the, was the most stressful it had ever been and i and it's kind of like the uh chicken or the egg uh or the cart and the horse but uh i contracted west nile virus in uh. 2014 which was pretty through early on. Is that through a tick? That's the one through the mosquito the Mosquito, bite. okay. Yeah, I think it was at El Dorado Lake. and um, I get mosquito bites all the time. Mm. And, and you never think, you always hear the statistics, or you used to, before COVID, every summer there'd be the statistics of like, well, there's been three reported cases of West Nile virus this summer in, you know, such and such county. Um, right. So, you know, be sure and, Use your, use your spray. Get the deed on yeah, there. <laughs> because I mean, most pe and most people don't have any symptoms from it. Remember, but you know, still, you want to be careful out there. So I think, like, well, okay, nothing to worry about. Yeah. It was it was scary, and you just started getting sick. Yeah, it was really weird. I mean, the symptoms it doesn't really matter, but it kept me out of teaching. For a short time, uh, sick, I had to recover. Doctor said, yeah, that's probably what it is, but uh, there's no treatment or, or anything or cure or anything. So well, if that's what it is, you know, it'll. It, you're just going to have to see how it plays out. And, you know, you, that's not you probably won't be. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking, well, don't some people die from it? Yeah, a few people die, but most people don't even get sick. So you're going to fall somewhere in between within there right. so i thought okay i thought well i guess the worst of it i mean it seems to be getting better so i guess i'm i guess it's gonna go away yeah from what i understood and it and i and it did but uh three years later three years three years later i was not doing well Still, but it was like, subtle. No, it was nothing. It, it, I had no in my mind. There was no connection. I okay. just was like three years later. You th got three years later. Sick. I was do, going about my normal activities, but my wife was noticing that my I, I was starting to get, get kind of foggy. Uh huh. And like you had brain fog. Yeah, yeah but nobody knew. Nobody was putting it into words. But it's like Bill, are, like why are you having such a hard time with this? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I'm just like, I don't know. It's really hard to remember. And, and then, and teaching was harder. And I was asking my coworkers, like, are you having like a really difficult year? So, oh, oh yeah. This year, the student, yeah, it's harder than ever. The students, I don't know what it is, but every year these <laughs> students are getting more difficult, more, you know, unmanageable. So, oh, okay. It's not just me. And I'm thinking this, I, this is really getting hard. Yeah. And by the time my dad was having the hospice care, uh, uh, well, my focus was just like, oh, whatever it is, I, I'm gonna, I'm there, but focusing on that. I was telling the schools like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta deal with um, family um, death, bereavement, you know, mm -hmm. funeral arrangement, whatever the standard time is. And then I realized I'm just getting worse i could barely function i said I, I i have to take some more like i need to take whatever sick time i, I can't come back to work mm -hmm. and i never did go back oh to work. Wow. i missed the whole half of the year i and 
And that was the same time your dad died. It was right after. And so oh, other okay. pe- other people thought, well, you just, you're grieving. Or I was saying, well, what's a nervous breakdown? Because does that, is like, is what I'm going through, is it because his death and all that, did I, am I suffering from a nervous breakdown? Well, nobody uses that term anymore, I guess. So it's like, I don't know, you're depressed, you're... Yeah, but... You're you know, seemed ill, right? You seemed like no. But I was having physical. I mean, I I couldn't stand up for very long. I I was in bed for like six weeks. Oh yeah. I wasn't painting. I I was wasn't doing anything. I was afraid that I was like, am I ever gonna get out of bed? Yeah. And because after you lay in bed for about three days, it hurts to lay in <laughs> oh, bed. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I was trying to get around like. I'm sorry. I, I gotta lay down again. I, I thought I'm gonna pass out if I don't. I have no energy. And it was so weird. Yeah. Um And I started to, you know, do all my reading. Of course, uh, you know, I, I jumped to all kinds of conclusions, and I'm, I'll believe. Just about anything, you know, conspiracy theories, <laughs> outlandish. <laughs> Thing. You know, I'm into UFOs and Bigfoot and aliens and <laughs> all this stuff. And so this goes all along with it, I guess. And I'm think, and, you know, I, I'm starting to connect West Nile virus because I'm reading that, oh, um, these symptoms, yeah, this is a flare up. Anybody who's ever had West Nile virus learns that it, it stays in your system. It's a virus like, like uh, HIV. It's going to be. Worse it, it, at times and be better there. at and times. And if you're if if your system if you if you're weak enough your immune system or your whatever if you're you're physically your like, body is letting its guard yeah. down it's gonna grab somewhere. So if you're going through a stressful period, I'm thinking, well, I just went through the most stressful period of my life. I think. I mean, some of it was the stress because I didn't feel like I was managing things well, uh-huh. so I couldn't figure out. Is this like, am I causing this or is the stress being put on me as a burden and I'm not reacting to it well? I'm not. Or it's causing the virus to flare up. Yeah. That's what I was reading. Like, well, everyone's saying that it causes a flare up. It sure, you know, it triggers. And these are the reactions. And of course, there's a range of symptoms that can. It's not the same for everybody, but right. so much of it seemed to be recognizable. I thought, well, that sounds like it explains it. But none, none of my doctors knew anything about that. So few of them ever deal with a West Nile virus patient in uh-huh. the first place that the idea that somebody's going to have like long term West Nile, they say like, no, we've never heard of that. That doesn't yeah. doesn't happen. You're we're going to send you for brain tests. Uh, had a neuro Neuropsych evaluation was the big, long brain test they did. My wife said, "Well, maybe you have early onset dementia now. Maybe you're already turning into your dad." Maybe you got Louis body been, or yeah, something like maybe that. She, yeah, maybe she's just been through all that, and yeah. she's thinking, "Oh God, here you know, here we go. You're going to be just like that." So we had that, and like, nope. What showed up from that is like, well, you got a really you know high functioning brain, but you've got this <clears throat> high level of anxiety and stress and a lesser level of depression well Mm -hmm. i was already treating i had chronic depression i'd been treating my chronic depression since the 90s i think okay and you know just this without thinking sort of like the prozac regimen that you know it was a popular book Back in the 90s, like, oh, everybody should take Prozac. Even if you don't think you need it, it's just a great pill to take, you know. <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess it's not going to hurt. And I I have been diagnosed with, you know, some kind of chronic depression. So right. I'll just keep taking that. But I was wanting to get off of that so many times. I didn't think it did anything. And the doctor said, well, we'll just change. We'll try different antidepressant. Maybe it's just not effective anymore. Right. They tried some weird things. One... One of them had me um, crying yeah. at the littlest thing. Uh. 
that isn't the one. And I found out it was <laughs> it's an actual side effect of this medication. Yeah. And I, you know, one time I'm in the in the waiting room at the auto repair shop. Yeah. And I'm reading a UFO book because that's pretty much all I read. Is it? Okay. <laughs> UFO. Oh, great new cases. And this guy, hey, are you interested in UFOs? And he's you know, this old guy, and he's telling me his personal story. It's like, story. oh, this is great. Tell me your UFO sighting. And then we're just talking back and forth. Next thing I know, I'm sobbing. I'm standing there in front of all these guys waiting for their cars, and I just start crying. It's like, what the hell's wrong with me? But like, we're not even talking about sad things. <laughs> that, and then I'm crying in restaurants and and eats and my whole yeah. family at the dinner table. And, you know, my granddaughter's like. Don't be scared now. Grandpa's just going to start crying now, but you know it's from the medicine, right? It's, not, <laughs> oh, it's like I put up with that for months. It was, but okay, got rid of that. And yeah. um, back to uh, the Prozac. But I, I found out about supplements uh -huh. that, I, that I hadn't taken before. And I think I eventually came around to uh, some effective management. Because the symptoms eventually mostly went away. Uh -huh. I had one weird thing was this ringing, mostly in the tinnitus, left side, of, but it's but it's not not that kind of ringing. Because I you know I used to have that from my loud music on stage, uh -huh. where you come home with that. This is like it's it's still there. It's it's a higher pitch or something. It's a uh, it's more internal kind of a really high pitch ring and i just had to That's get used to the it. ufos it could be aliens yeah. monitoring me yeah they're monitoring of course but <laughs> we'll leave that alone uh i just got used to it and it now it just doesn't it's That's usually not um conscious i'm, I'm not conscious of it but, doesn't bother you as bad enough to but nobody could ever explain well wh wh where does that come from but i knew something different was going on with yeah. me and i my goal was just to be able to um get functional enough again yeah and along well supplements i found out that um i had to solve my insomnia because that was just compounding everything um for whatever reason i had the insomnia as part of, part of the symptoms but uh -huh. that was making it harder to um uh, to fight everything else so i i was able to solve that probably with daily exercise that's that's what led to my pickleball oh, habit was we came full circle part of part of the um <laughs> taking the doctor's advice like you got to exercise every day get out there get fresh your heart air, rate yeah get your heart rate, your heart rate up. up and pickleball really does that a, i mean people uh, do not even understand how how high your heart rate gets when you're out there playing like you sweat it, I wish I had one of, is it a smart watch that would monitor your heart rate while you're playing pickleball? Uh -huh. See, I've never had that. But I, I can tell by the feeling and how much I sweat Yeah, that it's equivalent to like a certain amount of time on the stationary bike. Or, or jogging. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I had a mixture of activities. But that truly, that advice really made a big difference. And I love pickleball. And, um, and I discovered, before pickleball actually, the one of the first stages of recovery, I, um, I was validated. Now I'm talking about art here. Okay, I'll okay. get into a little bit of art. I um, I had already gone about a hundred, almost a hundred paintings in on my Wichita series of mm -hmm. paintings, which I know we didn't talk about this, but I started it in 2014 when we had settled back in here. Once I knew that I had some spare time, I was working part time. My dad was stable, so I'd just go out and paint Wichita scenes from from the old places I remembered that I uh, no meant a lot. I was rediscovering because yeah. mm -hmm. it had been a long time. Little plain air paintings and selling them on social media, surprisingly, and mm. thought, like, wow, this is a really cool independent way to produce and sell art mm -hmm. like no middleman just like i painted this here it is you want to buy it yeah okay i like that subject i know that place so mm -hmm. so i had a little like incentive and i was so i'd been doing that 
2014 through you know, up to 2017, well, also noticed that the last painting before my um, breakdown was kind of sketchy and kind of, it stood out as kind of vague and un resolved in a really? way in a, in, to me i don't know if anybody else not I just thought, not your normal work it's like yeah there's something a little like ominous about this one and then you know i have this big crash and it's and weeks and weeks go by i didn't think i knew i couldn't paint then but um when i finally felt up to trying it again i discovered that getting back to my little corner easel set up and everything and just picking a subject not not plain air but working from some reference photos that I'd been storing because by that time I was doing mostly in the studio uh I just chose something I thought well it's you know let's give it a try I don't know what I don't know if I can do this let's just give it a try mm -hmm. I put on some music like that was part of my routine and I go in it just go into that zone and I was pretty soon I was just painting my process and I was in touch with what I'd been doing before and I realized that I had established this painting process that was the you know the solution to all those years of the oil painting that I told you about that I did and coming yeah. out of graduate school that was me lost Emulating trying to be your somewhere else artist. and, and being and being st stressed out and destroying and starting over. Well, I had gotten over that with these Wichita, the first 100 Wichita paintings. I was already on this process that I had committed to. I told myself, I'm only painting nowadays. You know, I have no fantasy of becoming a successful gallery artist. You know, I'm an old guy now. That was my young artist dream. I don't have that. Dream. You mean the ego? The ego yeah. got taken I, out of it. Yeah, I've just, I'm just painting because it's something. I know it's a part of me, and it's a way I express myself. And people you know, like it, I and still, they appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I still sell some paintings once in a while, but you know, it's not something I have to rely on. So I I felt really good, about, and I felt it was the natural way for me to paint. It's like, hey, I'm not breaking any ground you know i'm th this is what i grew up liking about art and so this mm -hmm. is what i like to do it feels right it feels natural and i and i knew that if i kept doing it that way i would stay on the right path so the advantage of going back to it after this illness was that i knew where that place was mm -hmm. and i just had to see if i could get back to it and i could i got back to it and I found like it it washed away the the stress and the like the illness feeling. It was like this is therapeutic. Mm. This is like is this part of some healing larger process. plan? But was I did I do this before so that I would have a place to come back to and sort of um feel comfortable or feel Val what? validate that that what i had been doing was the right thing to do because now i see that here well here's the real value in it you know instead of you just wasting away and dying you this is what's going to sustain you if right. you do this this is just going to keep you <laughs> healthy that's and pretty amazing and i thought god that, there's a, a message i understand it's like i don't know who that's coming from but right this is what I should be doing because this is now this is life sustaining, like comforting and making you. Yeah. Sustain. And I couldn't at the same time, I realized, OK, I'm on disability formerly. I can't go back to teaching. I mean, I, that's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. My disability disability is temporary. It will run out. Yeah. And I'm not retired or anything. I'm, and and so. I thought, well, what's going to happen after this? What am I going to do? And the more I painted, the more my wife and I realized, like, oh, my God, we've got a small business now. You're, yeah. You're selling enough paintings, and now you're making print. You know, we'd never done anything like this, uh, the market that I do now so regularly. But right. 
I think maybe we yeah, started. You're at the you're at the farmers farmers old town farm and art market every Saturday. And that but that didn't start till COVID lockdown. So 2020. 2020. So I was just on the basis of okay, my paintings are selling pretty well. No guarantee. Just you know, on the Facebook and um, well, I'm trying to trying to have like arrange for shows shows directly. Like I I knew that okay, I don't want to work with a gallery because I like the directness. Now mm-hmm. I I get I like I'm more Personal. invigorated by the. Pers- the direct relationship like people like telling me well this is why i like your painting yeah it's like and th- and i want you to paint this like how about it's like I-, I can't have that dialogue if my paintings are just in some gallery somewhere and, so, and five thousand people are at the same time are trying to keep a conversation with you yeah, so it's hard I-, I love talking to people about it and i was getting maybe a little bit of press or something and social media but some restaurant shows or whatever i can't even remember but a few shows around town and well the city arts thing happened i think in 29 the beginning of 2019 yeah so i you know once i realized like wow i'm even going to get to have like a a big show where i can hang as much as i have of of the wichita thing and really show people that this is a a big mission that i'm kind of working on mm-hmm. i'm very committed to it and so uh i just kept working and we thought you know we're gonna have to make this our business mm-hmm. somehow and yeah. you've done so like for the past three four years now just steadily grown in your sales it, and growing in your market yeah it's, and, well, and your work is just phenomenal i think um i bought a one from you, the cathedral. You did the cathedral, uh, St. Mary's. St. Mary's, the one with Lord's Diner. Yeah, in it um, too. I don't that, know if Lord's but, Diner is in it. It's or if well, it's I looking did. from Lord's Diner to St. Mary's. I gave it to my mother because that's where she went to high school. She was the last graduating class at St. Mary's. The, ah, yeah. I learned later about the, them having a school attached to that. All girls school. And yep. I think that's the same building where. Um, my wife was hired. Uh, the, the offices are in that building now. The Catholic Charities, I think, occupies. I bet. That yeah, space. it's pretty but, neat. Have you ever been in that cathedral? N- uh, no, gosh, I hear such great things about all these interiors, mm-hmm. the places that I've painted the outside of. People, t- oh, have you seen inside there? Nope, <laughs> never <laughs> been in there. That's amazing. Yeah, you should so, definitely. It the, the doors are open actually. I think because um, I just walked in one day, just walked in like nothing. We all we talk about wanting to go to mass there. Yeah. Because for a while there, we were uh, showing up at different, even diff- different, completely different uh, kinds of churches. Mm-hmm. One time when I was still teaching here in town, I uh, worked with a maintenance guy who sang with his church group in, uh, somewhere, you know, on the north side, like in a, it seemed to me like a, a Baptist mm. church. We, uh, but it, it wasn't called that at all. But, you know, it was so energetic and music-oriented. I mean, like gospel-y mu- yeah. music. And, and when we, when my wife and I went, um, it was, I think... You know, we look around and we we think we are the only white people uh-huh. in this church, but they were so welcome. You know, so yeah. we were kind of conspicuous. You know, walking in, it's <laughs> like, well, yeah, we know someone's, but everyone was so welcoming. It was like, yeah, they thought it was like that. That was so much fun that we thought, like, we gotta, we gotta make this a regular thing. We gotta just <laughs> go visit like all the different kinds of churches and and denominations just to see how different people. Um, honor their religion or or yeah. practice practice their religion practice. Yeah. in in that way and we wanted well by this time you know we had our granddaughter uh regularly we we have been raising her and so we and she goes to a catholic school but we <laughs> we and that's been very important to her that's a whole other story but her religious foundation has meant a lot yeah. to her her growth 
and we just wanted her to see like a broader spectrum of that too. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you know, it doesn't have to be Catholic faith. You know, There's lots of faiths out how, there. Yeah, yeah, go see how how they do it. You know, we're not saying you have to be Catholic or anything. We weren't even practicing. Ca- I I was very lightly Catholic and to the point where like. Are you sure you know you're getting anything out of this? Like, is this really doing anything? It's kind of more for you. Catholic to me is more of a meditation because I was raised Catholic. So when I go into a Catholic mass to this day, it's more of a meditation because it feels comfortable. Like, I know what I, to say. Mostly, they changed a few prayers. Oh gosh, there's some new ones. That yeah, I don't I'm know like, now. I'm th- looking around like. What the hell just happened? I'm not going to be able to say this one. <laughs> when do you say that? <laughs> when did the light come in? But, uh, I don't know. Jeez. I, I like a lot of I like a lot of the traditions and practices, but I yeah, I'm I'm not I have to say I'm, I'm probably not not a great Catholic. Yeah, me either. But um But you're a I great support person. The ch- so. I love the the community and the church that has um helped our granddaughter so much now through the these formative years yeah and so uh, they didn't take a ruler to her huh <laughs> no good better not and i know i've told her that story too <laughs> well yeah. okay we've come to the part of the podcast where i ask bill uh, will you tell me a story of inspiration that you could share with myself and anyone listening right now you see I can gab and gab and gab, and then when I get asked <laughs> that kind of a question, I feel like I have nothing. You have so much. You have so much. I feel and like, I mean, I feel like I've been inspired at least four times just talking to you tonight. But maybe one of the things I already brought up could fit <laughs> the bill. Yeah, they could. I, um,. Well, this may be kind of anticlimactic, but I find when young artists or young people who have that spark, like, oh, gosh, I wish I could be an artist. I want to be an artist someday. And um, I get to talk to them, like, at the market sometimes. And I love that. And I try to tell them, you know, I, I didn't learn this until very late in my life. So that, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this, I don't know if it'll work because it, it, no one got through to me when I was young. I had to find out through trial and error and it, and it took a long time, better late than never. But I hope that you will remember to just be yourself, do, do what's natural to you uh, with your creative expression. Don't don't try to be somebody else. And um, it may save you just a, a lot of wasted time in your life. I, you know, because I, I wish that somebody had gotten through to me with that message. All right. That's really powerful. Um, so I, I just want to say thanks a lot for coming and catching a pocket with me and telling me your stories. It's been beautiful. And I wouldn't have had it any other way. So thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Laura. You're a very patient listener. Well, that's what I'm here for. (laughs) I'm all about it, and I love it. So thank you for coming. Love the music. Love the art. Keep it up. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to Bill Goffrey for participating in this project that I am doing with the Catch a Pocket podcast. Thanks for catching a pocket with me, Bill. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to end the episode with the embarrassment, Wellsville. I hope you enjoy it. See you next time. All the links for Bill will be in the notes section of this podcast. And if you have any questions or concerns, please email me at catchapocket at gmail.com. Thanks a lot for listening. See you next time. Driving fast down the road On the highway I guess so We stopped just past the Flint Hills There's 
to shine It was well spilled Met a country man Willing to lend a hand Fix the car Run the land Down to earth Offered us his heart